Well, uh, once again, welcome to all. Let's prepare for worship. This morning, I'm very happy to have Maddie Guy's <coughs> guests to please <coughs> pray for us. Thank you, Ms. Geyser Getz. Congregation, please stand if you're able. Look to the Lord your God and live. For though we were once dead in sin, let us worship God. Our hymn is number 681. Let us unite our hearts in the prayer for this Lord's Day. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, you bring salvation to the world. Give us strength to believe in him, that we may share in his victory over the power of death and fulfill the purpose for which you made us. For he dwells with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. The kingdom of heaven is a realm of reconciling love. Trusting in the promise of reconciliation, let us acknowledge our sin before God. Please join me. O oh God, King of glory and Lord of justice, we confess that when we proclaim your coming, we are quick to envision your judgment for everyone except ourselves. You know more than we can admit how many times we have failed to serve you. We have ignored you when you sit begging. We have turned away when you starve to death. We have been all too happy to let your suffering go unnoticed. We have denied your sovereignty and exiled ourselves to the kingdom of heaven. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Let us take a time of silent prayer.
Sing with joy to the Lord, because our righteous judge is our loving Redeemer. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us be upstanding. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Oh, go hug up. Good morning, Kathy. Much better. Much better. Peace, Jack. I feel much better. Peace, Karen. It's good to have you here. Peace to you. Peace. Peace. Peace to you. Welcome. Welcome. Peace be with you. Peace and with you. Good job. It's good to see you. Peace. How are you feeling? Good. Well, children, come join me on the chancel steps. Here's one for you. As we pass the Pez, after we pass the peace. Would you care for one? No, you don't. You gave it up for Lent, did you? Hello down there. My goodness, you're all the way down there. Come, have a pass. Well now, children, good morning. It's so good to see you all here in church on this good Lord's Day. And soon, this week, we're having St. Patrick's Day. Do you know the story of St. Patrick? Some, yes. Some, no. Well, the bottom line with St. Patrick is, is that he was first of all captured and taken off to slavery for six years in Ireland, tending sheep. And while he was there, he heard the voice of God. And the voice of God said to him, Patrick, escape! Go home! <laughs> and he took off and got back home. Now during his time of, of the, being a slave, he came to a strong faith in Jesus Christ. And when he got back home, he prepared for the ministry, the priesthood. And at the end of his time of preparation, he heard the voice of Jesus say to him, Patrick, go back to Ireland. And so he went back to Ireland as a missionary and he shared the faith of Jesus Christ all throughout Ireland. And so we wear green on St. Patrick's Day. You know why we wear green besides the fact that Ireland is a very green place? You know why? Green is the symbol of life. And in sharing the faith of Jesus Christ, we believe that we are sharing the good news of salvation and life that Jesus said He came to bring, which is full and abundant life. 
Now, you'll notice on this stole, which really isn't what we should be wearing during Lent, we should be wearing purple. There are a couple things on this stole. Do you know what they are? Crosses. What kind of crosses do you know? They are Celtic crosses. Sometimes called Irish crosses. And in our denomination and in its history, we often make use of this particular kind of cross. Do you see this kind of a cross anywhere else? Where? On the Lord's table, that's right. And if you look in the lounge, you'll see a beautiful Celtic cross hanging on the wall as well. Maybe even two. Let me tell you about the Celtic cross, if I may. This is a book that tells you everything you ever wanted to know about church symbolism. Crosses are a symbol of something. Let's see what it says about this. It says the Celtic cross. This is known as the Irish cross and the cross of Iona. It is a very ancient form having been used by the early Celtic Christians who traced their origin to the earliest centuries of the Christian era. Now this is important because do you remember the story of the Romans? The Romans kind of took over the whole world for a while. But guess where they never succeeded in conquering? Yes. Well, eventually in the Dark Ages, there was an uprising and the Romans got kind of beaten up. But in the height of the empire, as far as they got north was a place called Hadrian's Wall. And they never conquered Scotland and they never conquered Ireland. So, it is a very ancient form having been used by the early Celtic Christians who traced their origin to the earliest centuries of the Christian era. Many such crosses of extremely ancient origin may be seen in Great Britain where they were used in primitive times as wayside crosses and cemetery crosses. And then it talks about what it means. The cross is hollowed out in four places and a circle representing eternity placed upon it. Usually the circle lies on a different plane than that of the cross proper. Many ancient forms of the Celtic cross are most elaborately carved with intersecting circles and basket weave patterns and often with medallions in which are figures carved in low relief. The Celtic cross was always kind of a symbol not only of following Christ, but remembering that in Christ we live in eternity forever. And it was also a way to say that we will not be conquered by anyone other than Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. And so it says some years ago when Protestant bodies were afraid to use a true Latin cross, Latin meaning Roman, due to some fancied association with Rome, many a crudely designed Celtic cross might have been seen on a church spire. We have a strong, strong belief in Jesus. We wear the green because he gives us life full and abundant, we have a circle on the cross to remind us that in Jesus we have eternal life. And the cross itself reminds us that we follow no one except Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our God. Pretty interesting stuff, these symbols, this kind of Celtic cross, huh? Well, let's have a prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that you have saved us in Jesus and you give us life full and abundant right here and now and out through eternity. Enable us to cherish life and to share the life-giving word of God with others. Let your justice prevail. Let your love be at the summit of all things. We thank you that we follow you you are our Lord, our God, our Sovereign, and we pray in your name.
Amen. Well, God bless you children as you go to Sunday school. And we'll stand for the hymn. seated. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version this morning. The first Bible reading is Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. We loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take us, the serpents, away from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. The New Testament lesson is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. And you he made alive, when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the courses of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind, so that we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, who was rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not because of works lest any man should boast. For we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hear also the Lord's Gospel for us this day, as we turn to the third chapter of John, beginning with verse 11 through 21. A little critical textual comment. In Greek, there are no quotation marks per se or punctuation marks. And one of the difficulties when you're studying John is to know where things like quotations begin and end and so, regarding this passage, there are two opinions among the scholars. One is that the quotation mark should end on verse 15, which then would make verse 16 and following theological common commentary by the writer of the Gospel. And others say that it continues through verse 21 and would then be the quotation directly from the source, in this case, our Lord. May God bless you in the reading and the preaching of the word. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not spend, send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true Come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. One of the commentators, taking a look at the passage that's before us today, delights in saying that this particular chapter, this passage, is very much like a banquet that's being laid out before us. Just chuck full of wonderful and delightful things to feed our souls. But there at the center of the meal is that John 3.16. Right there in the middle is that verse that Christians have loved and cherished so very much, while you even see it occasionally noted at football games. For God so loved the world. Say it with me. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever and believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, my mission's done today. I can go sit down now. You've got it, of course. There it is for you, right out there in front of you. What I hope to do today is unpack it a little bit more for you than simply putting John 3.16 up at a football game. For God so loved the world, the entirety of the mission of Christ is understood in the incredible love of God. A curious thing about the Greek in this passage is that when John usually talks about Jesus coming into the world, he uses the verb sent. God sent the Son. God sent Jesus. Sent, 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 sent. But in 3.16 we see a different verb used. For God so loved the world, he gave. Why a sudden shift in verb, we might ask John. Why suddenly are you emphasizing the giving that God gave us Jesus. Why, John, you who love so very much your, your, your polarities, your, your, your life and your death, your light and your darkness, your righteousness and your unrighteousness as you weave the story of, of Jesus Christ throughout your Gospel, why the sudden shift from polarities to a single moment why the shift from the verb sent to the verb give? I suggest to you that we have come to the kernel of truth around which the entirety of the gospel is woven. John understands Jesus as God's gift. A gift of love and hope and salvation. And in pointing out Jesus and his mission in this way, as the only begotten Son, as we say in the creeds, eternally begotten of the Father, pointing to the fact that in who God is intrinsically in God's self, God is about begetting. God is about not just creating, but begetting. Creating God's self in the Son, Jesus. In this one moment we get the understanding of love not simply expressed like a Hallmark card, but love that comes in the form of a gift of a person who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Here He is. Here is the moment. Look exclusively at Him. Many of the other Gospels like to talk a lot about eschatology how things will be in the future, how things will end, how judgment comes into the world, on and on and on it goes. But in John's Gospel, he ignores all those considerations. And he simply says, in John 3, here's Jesus your Savior. You believe in Him or you don't. You receive Him as God's gift for you or you don't. And in this moment, as the gift of God is presented to you, therein lies all the things of eternity. It's all resolved and solved right here in this moment as you stand before Jesus. It's, it's all resolved right here in this pivotal moment of understanding that God loves you and Jesus comes to rescue you. I said earlier before I read the Scripture, that there's a question among the scholars as to whether the quotation 
ends at verse 15 or goes all the way to 21. That's a significant thing, I think. I think we have to actually, in preaching the Word, look at it both ways and lay it all out through verse 21, but also take note that if it stopped at 15, then Jesus is saying and pointing to something very profound for our understanding of who he is and who he says he is. Nicodemus has just come to him at night. We make a big deal out of that in the church, that he sort of was in stealth mode coming at night. Nicodemus was powerful, a ruler in the Sanhedrin. He comes to have a theological discourse with Jesus. We know that he was a rich man. We know that he was involved in caring for Jesus all the way through the death. Nicodemus comes at night not only perhaps in stealth mode, but because in ancient Jewish tradition, the most profound theological conversations among the great rabbis would generally be held at night, especially between midnight and 3 a.m. Boy, am I glad that I'm not a great Jewish rabbi. <laughs> wow. And Nicodemus says, what must I do? And Jesus says, be born again. And we get into that whole conversation. And then this follows from it. And in those first verses, 11 to 15, Jesus points interestingly back to the necessity of his being lifted up. He points back to the, the Old Testament lesson that was read for us today. He says that he as the Son of Man, he as the Messiah must be lifted up. And then we're referenced back to this story from, from the Pentateuch. You see, the people of Israel weren't always very faithful. They weren't always very nice. They were tough on their leaders. They could dig into Moses just like that. They'd been delivered from Egyptian bondage by miracle crossing the Red Sea. And as they wandered in the desert, even though God provided quail and manna for them and watched over them and led them very, very specifically, they started to kvetch. They started to complain. And they got very good at the complaining, you know. Unlike church people today. <laughs> Never again was this tradition continued. They started to complain and they started to rail against Moses. And then they got a little fool of themselves, you know. And when they got fooled of themselves, they started to rail against God, God's self. They started to presume to say, God, do you know what you're doing? You don't know what you're doing. How can you be doing this? And how are you doing this? And you, what kind of a God are you? Well, God didn't take that too well. And so, fiery snakes, poisonous snakes are loosed among the people of Israel. And snakes snipped at their heels and bit them and they were poisoned. And many of them started to die. And in that crucible of being bitten by poison snakes, they reconsidered their theological options. <laughs> and they ran to Moses, whom they were running down just moments before, and said, Moses, we're being clobbered here. Pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Get us out of this jam. And Moses prays to the Lord, and the Lord says, make a bronze serpent just like these fiery snakes and put it up on a staff and you lift up that staff you must lift up this bronze serpent and those who look upon the bronze serpent and look to that bronze serpent as a symbol that God has given them they shall be saved it doesn't say they won't be bitten but it does say that they will be saved if the quotation mark ends at verse 15, Jesus is pointing to that story as a core key story for his self-understanding. Wow. He is just like that bronze serpent going to be lifted up on a cross and die to take away the sin of the world. Wow. He is unique in this regard as Lord and Savior. He is the only begotten Son. Wow! Are you listening? Now ask yourselves, 
Why would God order Israel to make a graven image? I mean, you know your commandments, right? Confirmation class? No graven images. It's one of the commandments. Why would God say, in your pickle here, Israel, make yourself a bronze serpent? Don't you remember the story of the garden? The serpent spoke to Eve and started this whole kit and caboodle. You remember that? Why, for goodness sakes, would God say, take a bronze serpent and put it on a staff? You know what's going to happen. After we get through this event, the people of Israel will start worshiping, of all things, the graven image of the bronze serpent. Which is exactly what they did. It got so bad, King Hezekiah in Kings orders the destruction of that bronze serpent because the people were idol worshiping it. Oh, we people, how we are. Why would Jesus point to such a thing to identify with? I think there's a real wonderful reason behind this. Because the bronze serpent, as a serpent, is a symbol of all that is wrong with humankind. It includes the story of the fall of sin. It includes the sniping and kvetching of the people as they wandered in the wilderness. It includes the, the criticism and lack of following of God in its very form. It includes the imposition of foolish idolatry. So how is this like Jesus on a cross? The entire fullness of human sin is upon his shoulders as he comes up, takes himself to the cross to suffer and to die. And in his stripes, in his woundedness, we, like the Israelites, snake-bitten as we are, we are healed. God's good gift of love in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Say it with me again. For God so loved the world he gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Please stand for 2.19.
not a word. Let us confess the faith that makes us whole. Answer the phone. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, were crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us bring our good gifts to Almighty God. Loving God, we give you thanks for your great gifts to us. We ask your blessing on tithes and offerings that the good news of life eternal may go forth from this place in word and in deed and through the church throughout the world. We pray your blessing on your church, the strengthening of the church through your Holy Spirit. We pray for our denomination in particular and for our presbytery. Guide us and guard us and keep us true to the mission that you have set before us. Here are prayers of intercession for Carol as she recovers from issues of health, for Jean as you comfort her with your peace, for Walt and for Wendy and John and Linda and Booter as they continue to grow stronger and stronger. Surround Betty with your love that endures forever. We pray for Tom and Marie, for Anita and Todd, for Arlene and Sherry, for the Rinker family, for Tim Bond and family, for David, and for Rebecca. Give these dear ones what they need. We pray for college students who are returning to campus after spring break. Enable them to finish the semester in strength and in health. Be with those who teach them, lift them up,
as they pursue the academic course. You know all of our concerns, Lord God, that fill our hearts. We surrender them to your gracious care. Taking to our lips the prayer the Master taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is number 215, What Wondrous Love Is This? May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon and abide with you all, each and every one, now and forever. Amen.